You good? All right, I'm gonna get started. Thank you for coming. Been a good day so far? Good B-sides? It's getting better every year. All right, so um, we're kind of experimenting with how we're gonna do this, but uh, one choice I decided to make after some discussions this morning is we've kind of emphasized that one of the ways, the, the, one of the tools, probably the core killer app of the Cavalry thus far, has been our use of empathy and trying to be ambassadors and translators to find the willing parties in these affected industries that want to make things better and meet them at their level and their jargon to give them bite-sized chunks that we can work together on. So what I decided to do is um, Craig Smith, who's the founder of Open Garages, he and I presented in Detroit to a bunch of automakers. We've done several of these, but this was a particularly effective few slides that we, we tried to frame the intent of the uh, five-star automotive cyber safety framework. And for those who don't know, we, we published this cyber safety framework um, last year at DEF CON on an open letter to the automotive industry saying, basically, modern vehicles are computers on wheels. In fact, they're computer networks on wheels. So what we say is, look, over the last 50 years, you've been um, continuously making your cars safer, and you're masters of your domain. But now that these are computers on wheels, we're masters of our domain. Our domains have collided, and we'll have safer outcomes sooner if we work together. And to, to facilitate working together, we basically said all systems fail. It's not if cars will be hacked, it's when they'll be hacked. It's just a fact, right? There's a certain, well, you'll see some of the argument. But what we said is we want to be prepared for failure. So we don't want to make another PCI checklist. We don't want to have another prescriptive, brittle thing. I, I personally fought PCI. I said it's an abject failure for credit cards. And it's certainly not going to rise to the level that where, where packets meet flesh and blood. So we have to be better than the quote unquote best practices that aren't really working well for traditional enterprise security. So I want you to see what we told them. Uh, so you'll, you'll get a, a feel for the altitude, but it'll also frame and facilitate discussion because even our best and brightest in this community are arguing over things like, should you have remote over the air updates or not? So I want to frame it this way, and then what we'll do is instead of having those round tables that we did with the medical one, we'll have time-bound structured discussions on the mic uh, about some of the, the common uh, fears and trepidations the auto industry's had. Uh, but as we go through this, um, the Five Star was published first for the auto automotive industry, but we des deliberately designed it so if you take the word automotive out of it, it's pretty well suited for medical. There are some nuances, and that's why Bo and Scott are doing a slightly different take on it for the medical world, and for IoT, and for critical infrastructure. So these are just five postures towards failure. If all systems fail, it's five postures towards failure. So I'm just going to jump in as if I was talking to some automakers. Um, if my clicker works. So all systems fail, right? Anybody in here with any sort of engineering background of any type, computer science or otherwise, all systems fail, all. So this is a, you know, information is beautiful thing. There's just a certain defect rate per, per thousand lines of code, it's a fact. Now there's a different range depending on how good of a coder you are or not, but there's a defect rate per million lines of code, per thousand lines of code, KLOC, right? And there's over 100 million lines of code in some modern vehicles and growing. 100 million lines of code. You gotta know one's in there. There's gotta be a bug in there. It only takes one for something like a, a very bad outcome. And that's not new. What's new is the remote accessibility. So we had a lot of software in cars going back a long time. Uh, one of the Ford guys told me there's 69 separate computers in their car, right? And it's growing. So it's, it's not just, there, it's a computer, it's a network of computers. A wide open broadcast domain, collision domain on the CAN bus of computers. But what's been changing is the number and type and range of remote access cap capabilities. Starting with the tire pressure monitors, which are really close range, but they were required for fuel economy savings in the state of California. But now you have 4GE, a 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot standard in all Chevy vehicles on a go-forward basis. So we hardwired the internet for any sociopath on the internet to remotely reach out and touch someone. Completely changes the nature of the old tele telephone commercials. And if they can get access to any weak surface area on any part of that 100 million lines code plus, uh, then they can pretty much access everything else. So what isn't new is the vulnerability. What is new is the, the variety and range and type of remote accessibility. And that includes things like the App Store, right? Some of these things have a Facebook app in your car, so we can make evil apps, we can make evil downloadable apps. This could be the progressive dongle you plug into your OBD2 port. So even an unhackable car with no remote interface now has a remote attack surface because of the progressive dongle that you bought to lower your insurance rate. So the number and type of remote access is what's changed. 
Now, the cavalry approach, what we were telling them who we were, is that we were not out to drop O'Day on them. We, our problem statement was that our society's adopting technology faster than our ability to secure it, especially in areas that affect public safety and human life. Our mission was to ensure connected technologies that had the potential to affect public safety and human life were worthy of the trust that we placed upon them. So we weren't saying be Luddites and smash all your technology. Some of these features actually make you safer, right? Lane, blind, lane, blind spot and lane assist and adaptive cruise control, these are making us much safer than previous models of cars. So we're not idiots. Everything is a cost and a benefit, a risk and a reward. We just want to make sure that those, the math is right, right? And all variables are considered. And when something has the potential to kill you or to hurt you and your family, we want to make sure that the, the, the level of care that goes into that is commensurate with the risk it, re it represents. Uh, so we have four, four different projects, the medical device one that Bo and Scott went through earlier, the automotive one, connected homes, and public infrastructure. Uh, we had had airplanes in the public infrastructure one, but now we're probably going to, after this morning's discussion, we're probably going to separate that one out. Uh, and the basic approach that we want to use to work with the industries is collecting, connecting, collaborating, and catalyzing, right? Things are better with consonants and alliteration, but uh, what we wanted to do is instead of creating from whole cloth, we wanted to collect existing research and researchers that had already done great work in isolation but hadn't worked together. We wanted to connect them to each other and to willing teammates in industry. Then we wanted to collaborate in ways that hadn't been done prior and wanted to catalyze safer outcomes sooner. Right? So we don't want to just talk about the problem and admire the problem. Our goal is to be safer sooner. This will all figure itself out. right? It may be after a lot of crashes. It might take several years to do so. But we don't want to wait for that. right? Whenever you wait for a, a calamity or a catastrophe, the knee-jerk reaction is usually malformed, usually causes more problems than it, than it tries to fix. And you might have some sort of infringement on civil liberties or, or hunting and, and killing, not killing, but hunting and ostracizing researchers. Right? Blame the messenger instead of, instead of the vulnerable thing. So the, the name stinks, but obviously it was in recognition that the calorie isn't coming, so it falls to you to try. So the five star that we published on the open letter was basically um, to instill confidence in the public we had fancy names for what, what is your safety by design? Do you have a published attestation of your uh, security program? And if yours is way weaker than another car company and someone cares about it, they'll go to the one that does a better job. So it can be as detailed or as lame as you want it to be. Just tell us what you do to keep us safe. The second one was third party collaboration. Will you work with researchers, bringing you bugs, acting in good faith without suing them? But let me just skip to these. So the safety by design, evidence capture, that's tamper, uh, forensically sound, tamper evident, evidence capture which I'll get to in a moment. Do you have security update capabilities and secure update capabilities? And do you have segmentation and isolation separating critical systems that can hurt you from non-critical systems like the radio? And sadly, right now, pretty much everything can talk to everything else in most deployed vehicles. But the way I explained this to my neighbor was actually way better. I said, tell us how you avoid failure, take help avoiding failure, learn from failure, respond to failure, and contain failure. So star zero should probably be all systems fail, and then you go through these five postures towards failure. And it's a nice little foundational element. It's not the finish line, it's the starting line. And the way Craig Smith likes to put it is, the second you decided to connect yourself to the internet, you're responsible to these five things. No one forced you onto the internet. No one forced you to have the 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot. If you're going to do that, this is what comes with it. It's like your contract that if you're going to get a driver's license, you're at least going to know traffic laws first. Right? So that was the basic idea. So just to give you like a, a visual if you're left and right brain challenged, uh, we have really detailed versions of this, but let me put this in really simple terms. Microsoft used to be you know, plagued by security issues. They now have a high watermark of their SDLC, they call it SDLA, and they basically do threat modeling up front, and they do all sorts of different things, and they continuously improve their products. And despite them having one of the high watermarks for a really good safety by design, they still have you know, 20, 30 different security flaws they fix every month on Super Tuesday. Right? So it's a living, breathing thing, but they have matured to the level where they publish what they do and how they do it, and it's not a pen test at the end to measure badness. It's a, it's a system of designing and architecting things to reduce attack services, do exploit mitigation, et cetera. So for you guys, we basically say don't reinvent the wheel. Just take a look at what Microsoft and others do with their mature programs. But let's get the ones this room cares about. Do you have a beware of dog sign, or do you have a welcome mat? It's really that simple. Is there a way to report a bug without fear of prosecution or lawsuit or injunction, including under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which has both a federal crime element and a civil suit element. And one of the things, if you are researching this, since I am talking to a room full of researchers potentially, a lot of people think that a coordinated disclosure insulates them from, from CFAA. It doesn't. 
It insulates them from a civil suit. Some overzealous attorney general could, in prosecutorial discretion, still go after you without a plaintiff. And if you want proof of that, look at what happened with Aaron Barr. There was no plaintiff, and yet they proceeded ahead regardless. So this is really inviting the participation. And if I'm a buyer of a car, I want to know that you're going to do everything possible to learn of failures sooner so that you can make me safer. Because no matter how much a program you do internally, no matter how many researchers you hire, no matter how many you know, pen tests you get from a third party, you want to cast as wide in it as possible to find all the bugs within the various talent pools, including hobbyists, and just make it really easy for coordinated disclosure to happen uh, in a way that's collegial versus adversarial. Evidence capture, black box, right? We have in the airplane world and the trains, when something goes wrong, we want the entire industry to get smarter as a result. And the, the reason I really, really stress this one is you cannot simultaneously cry that there is no evidence of car hacking when you have absolutely no evidence captured to prove otherwise. It's completely circular, right? So if we want to think about this like an epidemiologist, we need more instrumentation to know how many people are trying to attack cars in the wild. How many, how many crashes had some level of interference from an outside party? Now, if you could have seen that Charlie and Chris were trying to replace the firmware image, if there was any you know, tale of the tape of what happened, then we would have a lot less conjecture. right? It, would, it helps all parties. In fact, in, during Karen's presentation, she said sunlight is the best disinfectant. This, this protects all parties. It helps exonerate the automaker if it really was pilot error. And it helps uh, learn from failures and classes of failures for the entire system. So if you don't know what NTSB is, they're the ones that study all these failures. And they piece together the airplane parts and whatnot to know what happened. So this is something that they really understood, whether they're hackers or not. They get the idea and the utility of learning from failure. And then come security updates. Um, we have them on our phones. We have them on our OSs. And yes, you can implement them incorrectly. And yes, you add a small residual attack, a net new residual, excuse me, a net new attack surface. You do. I assert it's worth it because the prompt and agile response. If we have to send USB keys that are manually and misapplied and may never be applied, or if it takes weeks or months to respond to an attack in the wild, I would far prefer something that can be done quickly if implemented securely, such that you can reach all the cars, even if the owner isn't paying attention. Right? So we did a write-up uh, about this one. This one was, uh, we focused more on this, but when BMW got hacked in February, Everyone was making fun of them for being hacked. We actually wrote it up as a success story. A third party researcher, so star number two, brought them the bug. And instead of suing them, they worked with them. Number two, they, they patched all of their vehicles over the air before anyone knew they were vulnerable, completely eliminating the window of opportunity for adversaries to be in the foot race to beat defenders. And number three, in the process of updating it, it was pointed out to them that their updates were being passed in the clear over HTTP without encryption. So they changed that. And without anyone forcing them to, they told the public that that had happened, which enabled their competitors and their colleagues in industry to avoid making the same mistake. So we actually looked at that as a really good success story, because all systems fail. Let's not mock the failure. Let's learn from the failure. And their response enabled that. Now, is it perfect? Would I have preferred they didn't get hacked? Of course. But they were able to do it so quickly and so pervasively. And I'm not going to get into it yet. but. There was a lot of people celebrating a little prematurely that because there's a patch available for the Jeeps that we, we protected everybody. I was told that for things like airbag recalls that people know can hurt them, they never get 100%. And for something like this, I was told it could be as little as single digit percentages uptakes of the recall. So that means whoever doesn't patch this particular flaw, bad guys now know about it. And it's not, a, not guaranteed to me yet that they'll all be fixed. The only mitigating control in this particular Jeep example is they're able to do some blocking at the sprint carrier level which makes you feel a lot better. But they were lucky this time. So the other advantages of this, which we got into that really helped some of the automakers make their choice, was it's not just the safer thing to do. It's also the cheaper thing to do, and it's better for brand and reputation. Having a recall at the factory costs labor, costs brand damage, costs customer confidence. It's a stigma. It's a mistake. Having a software update is routine. It's cheaper. There's no labor involved if you do it right. So actually, one of the automakers, Ford, has announced that they're going to have over their updates in future models, I don't think it was really because of the safety benefits. I think it was because of the cost benefits. So sometimes the safe thing to do is also the economic thing to do. And then segmentation, isolation. I, I really struggled for a good way to put this, so I use submarines. Right? Uh, you can have a flood in one compartment without flooding the whole thing. And the problem to me, I think most of the media coverage of this Jeep hack is miss the point. It's not about 
this one version of the Uconnect. It's not just about this one automaker, because honestly, other automakers will use the same IT systems, right? One IT system can be using other auto OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. It's that when my radio is invariably, inevitably hacked, I don't want it to be able to disable my brakes, to cut my engine, to turn my steering wheel for parking assist. And that's really the heart of what I would rather we be focused on is how can we accelerate the segmentation and isolation of systems. All right, so as I alluded, uh, Bo, myself, and some others, we really wanted to put a positive spin on this because we do lots of things wrong. I, I said this morning during our opening remarks, when United Airlines came out with their coordinated disclosure policy and their bug bounty, it was mocked profusely by this community. Maybe not the people in this room, because they didn't allow you to touch the airline and the Wi-Fi, and they, they misworded some things and everything. I said, guys, this is their very first toe in the water, and we bit it off like a bunch of ravenous piranhas. And what that did is it, it discouraged other airlines that were also planning to create a, a, a welcome mat versus a be aware of dog sign from doing a similar thing. And you got to look at this as if this is their first introduction, they're going to crawl, then walk, then run. So some of us need to decide to look at what they're doing right and amplify the rightness, which earns us the permission to help them do step two and step three and step four. So we really heralded this and we, we praised this, even if there's lots of room for improvement. And that's kind of the way we're going to build the trust to have these organizations um, start the journey. So um, I also got into an argument with some of them in the room, so I added this slide last minute. I call it the, uh, the stages of SSL, but I actually I think I added a fifth one, which is typically the, the, it goes like this. They're like, well, we do security. We have a security team. I said, okay. So stage one is, what's SSL? Right? So they're not, they don't even know to think to do any sort of encryption. And then the next stage is, well, we architected it wrong which if you remember the Apple bug or Fire Sheep, right? It, it was just, it was architect, oh, Fire Sheep, forget the Apple one. Fire Sheep was architected wrong. So they were passing the credentials in the clear and then, and then encrypting the payloads. But you could just intercept the initial handshake. Then you can architect it right, but implement it wrong, right? And that was like the Apple bug or um, HTTP client. So it was just coded wrong, right? And then you can architect it correctly and implement it correctly. And then you have stupid stuff like Heartbleed. Right? Where these third party open source components can be vulnerable and are vulnerable. In fact, while Heartbleed got a logo, there were 41 other CVEs assigned to the OpenSSL project in 2014 alone. Because when there's a drop of blood in the water, sharks circle in frenzy. And I can map this over and over and over with my data that every time there's an open source flaw, tons more are found in the same chunk of code because people initially implicitly trusted it. And they go, oh, wait, there's gold in them hills. And then you have a gold rush or a feeding frenzy. And that's the, those, those are the ones that have CVEs. The, the dark markets, they're finding more and they're not publishing them. So there's other stages as well, which is, I think after this one, we had to add the one where you can actually break the crypto, which can happen, just less often. So if you really contrast this, I call this in the meantime to enlightenment, right? What's the meantime to enlightenment? So Microsoft, you know, a lot of my friends have framed on their wall a hate letter or a cease and desist letter from Microsoft or Oracle. Most of them are from Oracle. Uh, and now you fast forward, and not only does Microsoft had the memo where they got religion that security was important, uh, they also added the Blue Hat conference, which initially was a private she-she invite-only thing for elite hackers. And then they had the Blue Hat prize. And now the Blue Hat, uh, one of the Blue Hat prizes has a six-figure-plus payout if you can come up with new evasion uh, techniques or anti-evasion techniques. And people like Katie Mazuris at the time were like playing with the incentive structures and the sweet spots to see just how good could this get. And she had internal departments fighting to get into the program. Because not only is it not hated when third-party researchers are finding bugs, it's a vital and necessary and critical part of their SDL. It's, it's cherished by the senior executives at Microsoft. They went from being the most hated, and I'm not a fanboy at all, but they went from being the most hated vendor in the space for the hacker community to one of the most integrated. And that meantime enlightenment took 15 years, maybe 20, depending on who you're talking to. Can't let that take that long for cars. We want meantime to light up maybe three to five years. So one of the big problems, which maybe we'll get to in the Q&A, is this happened to the industrial controls hacker community, where everybody gets so overwhelmed with all the legacy stuff that was designed insecurely, that was not defensible by its architecture, that can't be patched, or would be really problematic to try to patch it. And instead of focusing on avoiding future mistakes, they look over their shoulder and they never fix anything in the future. And what I've been trying to tell the car companies is, yes, you have a bunch of hackable vehicles in the field. And yes, you can't do anything architecturally to fix those. 
So they're looking at bolt-on aftermarket solutions, which is going to reinvent the same problem we have in enterprise. Antivirus and firewall and IPS and layer after layer after layer, which not only do they add costs, but they add complexity and often are the point of compromise that allows you to be hacked in the first place. Right? There's an entire hit list of security products which were the point of compromise. Right? Because all systems fail. All systems. So what I really encourage them to do is have one strategy for your go forward to make them more defensible, more segmented, more instrumented, and a, and a different tactical strategy for the, the sunk cost in the field. And in this particular case, some of the good news is the older the vehicle is, the less attack surface it has. It's not perfect. We're in a really bad state, right? There's, there are prone, hackable, unpatchable vehicles in the field right now. And we found several of them. But at least for our part, our choice has not been to publicly disclose them. We're working aggressively with the vendors where they can fix them. But some of these cannot be fixed. So it might cost us a sensational headline, but we are helping them make future choices differently. In fact, we had to contrast ourselves because some of the researchers that do say things on stage that we're probably going to talk about, they're feared and hated, and they trigger antibody responses from the legal teams in these companies. So you have an engineering team that really wants to work with you, and they're trying to do the right thing. And as soon as there's a sensational headline, they lose control of the internal narrative, and it goes right into legal's hands. And they can't do the things that they want to do. So we're seeing some of the results of the, of the stunt hacking, but we're not seeing the cost and the delay and how it's harming the relationships and trust with the research community. So we're trying to make sure that there's at least one strategy for present stuff, for past stuff, and a different strategy for future stuff. But the other thing is a lot of the stunt hacking is, poking, is a pointing finger at past failures. And what we want to be is a helping hand for future success. And a lot of them are using very specific attack technique, and we're trying to show very robust, defensive, resilient architecture. So it's not a better than, it's an also, right? We need all sorts of different kinds of points of light and all sorts of things that catalyze action, but building trust has really been key here. And then one of the ones that comes up often is they say, well, yeah, Josh, they could hurt me, but no one would hurt me. There's no money in it. Which, A, there's a lot of money in it. There's a stunning lack of creativity. Just think crypto locker to start your car. Give me a Bitcoin if you want to start your car again. Or spyware to track your spouse's movements or whatever the thing could be. There's, there's going to be ways to do money. In fact, if I was a bank robber, I would initiate the remote kill switch on the pursuit vehicles so I can get away easier. Um, but they're forgetting there's all sorts of accidents and adversaries. So number one in any threat model should be the adversary known as Murphy. Right? Murphy's law. Accidents happen. You don't need a sentient adaptive adversary to have problems. And I loved it when uh, Bo came up with the accidents and adversaries. But there could be ideological ones. You could have anonymous or protests. You could have pranksters. You could have nation states. Remember when Putin disabled the communications in Georgia before rolling tanks in? Then the objective of terrorism is terror. If you wanted to cripple the US economy, do you know one of the Senate staffers told me that, Josh, the automotive industry is a double digit part of the US economy. And if there is any crisis of confidence in the public to buy new cars, it could have a material impact on US GDP. And one in nine Americans is employed, is employed directly or indirectly in the automotive or automotive service industry. And you could do tremendous economic damage to the US with one high profile, scary attack. So they're not willing to wait for something bad to happen to start a, a multi year correction loop. So, but moreover, even if you don't want to come up with these like really extreme, exotic movie scenarios and movie plots from Die Hard or Black Hat. I don't want to depend on the kindness of every human being on Earth. Right? Every motivation in the human condition can be used to assert their will on others. And the more remote attack surface we add, and the more um, lines of code that we add, the easier it's becoming. And even though it might be really, really hard for Charlie or Chris to find this, we all know the game. The person who comes up with the first payload did the heavy lifting. When it becomes a Metasploit module or a free attack tool, any script kitty can do it. And if you don't think that extremist groups have hackers on staff, they certainly have money to hire a Romanian one. Like, you know what? Al Qaeda doesn't actually uh, like to do drugs a lot, but their number one source of revenue is opium, and their number two source of revenue is spam. So we're just not thinking about this. And what I'd ra rather say is I don't want to hope they wouldn't hurt me. I want to know they couldn't hurt me. We've changed the nature of the discussion when we're kind of hoping that every person on Earth is a good person. And what I'd like to remind some of the Congress creators is, there was no money in the Charlie Hebdo attacks. There was no money in the Boston Marathon bomber. There was no money in the kid shooting up his school at Sandy Hook. If you're depending on 100% of humanity being discreet enough and careful enough and kind enough not to hurt you, I think we're going to be disappointed. So let's just make it easier. Let's give them less juicy attack surface. 
So there's a lot of complex supply chain stuff, which I'm not going to get into here. But basically, they're saying, well, it's not our fault. It's one of our suppliers. But there's already case law that when wooden wheels, in this particular case of McPherson versus Buick, when wooden wheels were breaking, Buick said, it's not our fault. It's the wheel company. But what they said is, you were the final goods assembler. And regardless of which suppliers you chose, you're responsible for what happened, because you're the one who delivered that. Now, in today's lawsuits, they'll go after everyone in the chain. But there's already existing case law. We don't need cyber case law here. If people are using third parties and suppliers that are vulnerable and known to be vulnerable, and they're not managing it, they're going to be held responsible, at least in the court of public opinion. But one of the points that really worked for them is I, I just kind of put this up there, and I, I let people try to guess what it is. Anybody know what that is? Deep water horizon. Deep, deep water horizon. Anybody know how many days and days and days it was flooding? Was it? I mean, it was just like agonizing months, right? I think the last number I heard was like cost them $42 billion so far. Um, I said to them, really simple thing. Now, while we don't publish these things, the, th the sad truth is they all know that the remote kill switch in a lot of the vehicles and some of the remote features have known vulnerable open source code exposed that is unpatchable. And they're kind of just hoping that no one does it. No one ever finds out. But all of them know this. So at one of the government things, I, I had six of them standing around. And I said, so guys, we've built some trust now. Let me just ask you a question. And they said, OK. I said, if, if your company ends up on the nightly news tomorrow because your remote kill switch was tripped and disabled fleets of your vehicles, what's your best case minimum response time? I was very careful in the way I worded it. And no one said a word. You could hear a pin drop for a good 30 seconds. And then one of the guys cursed, and he goes, all right, I'll go first. Let's face it, the 2018 models are already done. And remember how I phrased the question. So what's your best case minimum response time? So he basically admitted he can't do anything about the current fleet for that particular manufacturer. And then another competitor of his said, that's actually worse than that. Some of our third-party tech packages are done through 2020. And we're assuming that we could even port one of the newer models into one of the older models. So I'm not comforted by that response time. That's a response time measured in years. Now you contrast that with the over-the-air updates from Tesla and the over-the-air updates from BMW and the declared intent to have over-the-air updates from Ford. And if anybody in the room knows of other organizations that have the ability to do secure over-the-air updates, please tell us, because we want to praise that capability and encourage it. And this was the thing that really made them say, that's why we need updates. Okay. So your MTTR, your mean time to respond, cannot be weeks or months. Cannot. And again, we cannot celebrate the fact that a USB key is being shipped to dealers. Because unless you can be sure that you've patched enough of the affected demographic, then they are sitting ducks for a now known attack vector. Is this valuable? OK. So we basically said, look, there's a fork in the road. You can either, uh, sorry about that. You can either wait for regulation and lawsuits. Or you can attempt to, to, to keep yourself in the driver's seat and embrace these principles, stop fighting them and arguing over them. Let's start to figure out how to do them. And by the way, this is just the beginning because we haven't even touched vehicle to vehicle, which is the cars talking to each other, or vehicle to infrastructure, which most smart city stuff, if you've seen Cesar's uh, research from IOActive, by design, they're not, uh, there's no authentication in the wireless transmissions from the inf infrastructure. By design, they don't want to have the, the mechanics and the, the, the technicians have to learn and remember that any passwords. So the vehicle to vehicle, there's a security principle. We have very few first principles in engineering for computer science. But one of them is called security is not composable, which really boils down to you can take a secure thing A and a secure thing B. And when you put them together, you might not have a secure thing. So you cannot compose security. But what the inverse, which gets less talk, is you cannot take an insecure thing A and, a, and a anything and make a secure thing together. So a necessary first step to being able to have trustworthy vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications is having something that can be trusted atomically. And we are so far away from that, this scares the bejesus out of me. Because think about the autonomous or semi-autonomous push. We're not going to wait for it to be safe. We're already doing it. There's already test runs all over the place. It's, it's very disconcerting to me. So it really is unsafe at any speed. So I like to borrow some of the supply chain principles from Toyota and whatnot, but I'm going to skip that for right now. Because what I was basically saying is to them is the security and software development industry, if you're paying attention to Lean and Agile and DevOps, 
they're kind of borrowing things from Dr. Deming, who invented Toyota supply chains for Japan after post-World War II. And he did not make these principles to make cars safer, because there was no one safe at any speed book until the 70s. He invented these things to make cars faster and more profitable. Faster and more profitable engineering. So what, we're, what I was trying to say to them is, look, this isn't a one-way street where we're telling you what's all in your business. We want to learn the things that you've done and apply them to our software development practices so that we can have higher quality parts from higher quality suppliers and know where they went. So when we have a defect like a heart bleed, we can do a prompt and agile recall. One of the reasons it took Phyllis Schneck at DHS six and a half weeks to know which systems were affected by heart bleed is she had absolutely no idea which of the third party and homegrown apps used OpenSSL or a vulnerable version. So we could actually learn a lot from them too. And that's what we're trying to say is we want to learn from each other. And we said the road ahead is going to be up to us, but um, that was how we framed it. Now, really short and sweet, we use a lot of pictures. Um, and we're not trying to tell them that we know better how to do what they do. We know that the, the knowledge of what to do to make a safer sooner is going to be part of their expertise, part of our expertise, and the empathy and the translation to do it. And yes, we're calling it cyber safety. Actually, I skipped that part. I shouldn't. If you weren't here this morning, hold your nose, eat your lima beans, and get used to the word cyber. Policymakers use it. Auto industry uses it, medical devices use it, and there's a more important reason for medical and auto, and I'll state it right now. When you talk about security, cybersecurity, to most of the auto world, they think privacy. 99 out of 100 conversations go straight to the confidentiality of data. And it's our fault, because most of our industry is about the confidentiality of the CIA triad. And most of what they've been bludgeoned with is tracking users' movements and tracking people. So if you say security or cyber, they hear privacy. And if you say safety, this one's even worse. Safety means physical safety against intended use. It's 200-year-old discipline, and they're really, really good at it. Here's the problem. Hacking is, all of hacking is unintended use and misuse and abuse. So there's a gap between privacy and safety where no one's looking. So we, for lack of a better term, and if there's automakers in the room that want to help us pick a better term, We've deliberately said cyber safety because it's different enough that to make them at least say, what do you mean cyber safety? And then we can at least have a conversation. So that is all I have graphically. Any vehement, oh, there's one more thing I want to do. I know there's at least one car company in the room. Uh, and you guys remember the five star? One of the five stars is, do you have a coordinated disclosure policy saying you will not sue third party researchers acting in good faith? Um, Tesla. Would you guys like to stand and take my and hopefully some other people's grants that you are the first company to declare that you will not sue third party researchers? Tesla? <laughs> and not only are they the first, they've already taken step two before anyone else has taken step one. So they went from we will not sue you to adding a bug bounty if you saw the announcement through bug crowd. So now they are willing to give some sort of financial reward for people that do this. So I think one of the first steps to enabling the learning curve, the upward spiral to make their program better, thank you, is to, to take help and cast a wider net to use all the talent of all the people that might find bugs. It's also of note that they're one of the only vendors that has an over-the-air update system. So we want to encourage and congratulate good behavior, even though there's going to be some hacks of some Tesla at DEF CON, and even though there's going to be some failures because all systems fail, a culture that wants to find and eliminate failure and has the ability to promptly respond to it is one that I want to promote. So any automaker in the room that wants to start having a coordinated disclosure, we will help sell it to your GC and sell it to your executive team. We will help you define if your updates are designed securely. Because what we're trying to be is an honest broker to freely give learnings that we found the hard way by doing it wrong in the cyber world for this long. We want to make sure that we can help people be safer sooner, and those that have taken the help are doing great things. Now, I don't want to for a second suggest that other car companies aren't doing amazing things. In fact, what we have found now that we've been talking through these five different categories is there's some really good things being done by lots of car companies. The frustrating part for me is they're so tight-lipped and don't talk about it. Their culture is very closed by, by its nature. That no, they're not getting any credit for it. So people see their failures, but they don't understand that some of the future choices are pretty darn good. All right, I'm going to open the mic and uh, take any feedback or questions or violent objections before we move to the next phase. Is this slightly valuable? These are really basic things. We're not telling them how to be hack proof. We're just telling them how to be ready for the existence of hacking. 
Anybody. I am going to bring up the Charlie Chris stunt hacking thing, but I wanted to see if there's any foundational questions first. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, can I borrow a Tesla for a really long time? Uh, did I make it hard on the, uh, the white border? Okay. All right. Now, there's some controversial stuff in there. Yes. Do you want to use the mic or do you want me to repeat? Uh, it's hard to synopsize that. Basically, do there have to be another cell plan or, or separate data service or SIM card in the car? Can it, be, can it piggyback off a cell phone? Look, there's probably a number of ways to skin this cat, and we're not trying to be PCI and prescriptive. I think the, the key factor is can you securely deliver content that was meant to be the content you delivered, and can you promptly do it with a high attach rate? So there's lots of ways to do it. Um, you could do it through a CD in the mail, through the CD player. You could do it through a USB. But each of those should be analyzed uh, for their efficacy and for their, their, the, the ability to the attack surface, right? Threat modeling 101. There's just too many hops, too many steps, too many ways to get it wrong. So I'm, I'm being very vague when I say it should be over the air securely. There's a pretty good, there's a couple solutions I've seen that do it slightly differently. And there's trade offs, but you know, experimentation's good. So what we really want to see is prompt and agile recalls or prompt and agile response. All right, Renderman. Is it another Tesla request? Yes, but a legit uh, question for the Tesla folks. Why they might not be able to comment, by the way. No. Uh, no, sir. Uh, why did I not see WPA uh, Radius or whatever car that was on a Tesla? I know it's a PSK. If I want to run a higher level of security on my home network, or the sure. system setting up, it's I'll put that in the request bucket to discreetly discuss. <laughs> yeah, you. Um, are there any vendors that are offering up to vendors to just completely shut down uh, essentially your email or something like that? Is that what you're saying? Just take the car offline. Taking the car offline? Yeah. Making it a dumb car? That has come up a little bit, but I, I don't think anyone's decided to do that. Like, the, there's, there's tension within these organizations. They, they want to have a high-tech package that's attractive to their customers in the market who don't know yet that, it's, that those high-tech features add insecurity. Um, but one of the things, uh, when I was on a business trip, my wife was trying to buy a new car, and the guy was like really trying to hard sell her on the 4G LTE Wi-Fi standard. She goes, yeah, I don't think you know who my husband is. <laughs> uh, and, and, and since it was a deal breaker for her, she's like, um, he's like, well, you could always shut it off. She goes, I'm not an engineer, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be on and attackable even if I tried to shut it off. But that is one of the discussions is can these things be off by default, right? So if someone wants to a hardened configuration, so don't give me massive, you know, full, full uh, throttled um, attack surface until I elect to use that feature. So there is discussion about default configuration or, or elective attack surface um, versus being able to, to, to disable it. Or not breaking a car. Yeah, some of these are just fragility things, right? In fact, I actually thought the first hacks would not be driving people off the road by turning the steering wheel. I thought it would be bricking them, you know, property damage. Because bricking is way easier than, than you know, uploading a successful payload. All right, uh, you please. I agree with you. Um, I did get an answer from one of the manufacturers who said, we are a luxury car service, and our customers want the stereo to dynamically adjust based on the noise from the engine. 
So it is vitally necessary that we can have our infotainment talk to our you know, control systems. And I said, that's worth maybe killing them? And that was the first part. And you get, they said, well, no one's going to kill you. And I said, OK, why not have a microphone? <laughs> um, right. It, it, but the, the point is, like, some, somebody was just trying to solve a market requirement or a perceived market requirement. And look, we did a lot of things before they ever thought the cars would be hackable. In fact, prior to the remote attack services, having a, a wide open CAN bus, but CAN is controller area network bus invented by Bosch during an era where the notion of a car talking to anything but itself was, you know, it would, be, it would have been hard to anticipate. So there is a shift to alternative technologies or many of these car companies. If you, I, I personally went to the, the, the Tesla car last year at DEF CON and saw the multi-CAN bus you know, segments of individual instances of CAN bus. And as long as there's some sort of effective gateways in between them, then you could do different control flow for data. But a lot of this is they just didn't know. Now we know. And now that we know, to varying levels of knowing and accepting we have a problem, it's going to take a while to make future designs better. But yeah, these things were not meant to be secure, just like the internet was not meant to be secure. And, and then unfortunately, once you can impersonate another ECU or CAN message, you can do a lot. Uh, you were in the, in the corner. I saw you at the corner of my eye. Yeah, so this is, I'm just going to put that in the entire bracket of the sunk cost and the, and the previously designed less defensible architectures and the long tail of their deployment in the field. Now, I can't predict how that's all going to go. It could be that, you know, for, after the Corvair and, uh, was criticized by Ralph Nader and Unsafe and Speed, it was actually the Pinto that had more explosions. So people kind of stopped buying Pintos. And if they had one, they got a different car. So if it gets bad enough for a particular make and model, I think people will stop using them, is my hunch. But you know, there's going to come an economic point where what's the cost of fixing an unfixable thing versus incentivizing an, an alternative replacement. Yeah, there's, there's probably a number of technical solutions, but the, the, the first gating item is they don't know to fix it or don't want to fix it. And, and by the way, some of the car companies have really good attitudes about this, really good. And you got to stop bludgeoning them when they are they got religion and they're trying to fix it. They can't have a time machine and go backwards, right? Um, but some of them have pretty terrible attitudes as well and need an attitude adjustment. Um, the next one is the guy in the way back. Um, they're so early in the learning curve, some of them. Like when we first, uh, Bo and I had about a call a day, 45 days after we announced the DEF CON last year. And some of them were um, suppliers of parts, you know, tier one suppliers to the automakers. Some of them were like dealer associates in America because they wanted to know when people start asking for these questions, they wanted to know how to answer them. Um, in the course of doing that, for the first three to six months, some of them were just assuming we were going to extort them. Um, they thought we had a, a pile of O-Day and we were going to be like their worst nightmare times, you know, 400 new people. So the trust levels weren't there until I think the turning point, and I know this isn't what you're asking, but I'm just trying to get, it's a good t time to give you the timeline. One of the, the slides I left out was Senator Markey put out the um, hacking and tracking report in February, the same week that the BMW was hacked, the same week that uh, it just happened that, that uh, Craig Smith and I did a thing on NBC um, uh, exploiting a car for, or having the journalist manipulate a car from 3,000 miles away. Um, the same week as, uh, what was the fourth thing? Uh, oh, that's 60 Minutes special uh, with DARPA doing the car hack. So there was a lot of panic in Detroit in the auto industry that, that week. And, and then about a week after that, there was a class action lawsuit 
instantiated from the trial lawyers for the cars that had material exploitable weaknesses as demonstrated on television. So what, one of the things we said to them is, look, I know you guys don't yet trust us or you don't yet understand our motives. Our motives are pure. We're talking about patterns that anybody can employ. We're not being prescriptive. And typically, the government prefers self-regulation over heavy-handed government, no matter what the political orientation. So you have a chance to embrace this and control your own fate, or you can let someone else regulate, and it may actually incentivize the wrong things and set you back in an additional five plus years, because it's really hard to change law. And it really seemed to resonate, and that was around May 31st, April 1st, um, was when we were there. And that's when things shifted from, we, we disagree with this five-star thing, to pretty much every automaker said, well, this is how we're embracing star number four. Or will this approach to do segmentation work, or is this easily hackable? Because some of them were using like logical isolation stuff that hasn't worked for us for 10 years. So we wanted to save them. They had the right instinct, but the wrong uh, focus or aim. So we want to improve their aim and their time to value. So I, I would say that only around that time frame did they actually start realizing, OK, these guys are legit, and they're not here to hurt us. They're here to help us. So some of them aren't yet far enough along to start asking the questions that you're asking. Sort of an answer. All right, you, yours is your second question, all right. A lot of pieces to that. Um, to repeat this for the video, um, you're, you're basically suggesting that in avionics, for example, there can come a level of technical debt and interoperability problems where too much tech becomes unwieldy. I would, you know, I'd flip my flippant, sarcastic answer here in Vegas is, I'm not sure we've figured that out for enterprise security yet. Um, you know, the, the amount of additional complexity and tax surface from our security controls is kind of out of whack in a lot of cases. But no, I think that's a good point, but not one that's well understood in most of these conversations. I am having it in the enterprise world, though, where I'm saying um, technical debt compounds interest, and they understand that. So what we're there's, there's becoming a push in DevOps where all that free open source code and the code bloat that comes with it, it actually behooves you to have more elegant designs with fewer functions. Think of like when the iPod came out. It didn't have a lot of bells and whistles and buttons. It had very little functionality, but it was enough. And people appreciated the ease of use over feature richness. So there, there's some people figuring out less is more. Um, but I don't think that the wisdom's there yet that you're hoping for. Um, you have not gone first, the guy in the back. And then you. Buses or RVs? Uh, I have not. It's possible Craig or some of the other ones have. Um, they share a lot of the same infotainment architectures. Um, I just saw a pretty scary thing that uh, the track, the shipping truck fleets are, are already doing autonomous trials. Remember who that was? Was it Volvo? Daimler. Daimler's doing uh, autonomous tractor trailer trucks. Uh, they, they've, no, they have uh, requested approval to do autonomous fleets. Um, so I, I'm not directly aware of that, but a lot of these principles will apply where we want the segmentation and isolation. We want. Uh, Reporting disclosure, you know, policies, etc. All right, your turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Are, yeah, go ahead. Oh, lucky you. Um, 
So since you have one, can I encourage you to look at this? <laughs> um, it's funny you brought that up. One of the journalists last year um, was uh, an investor in an Indiegogo Kickstarter project for the Heads Up Display helmet. And the, the economics aren't really there because the cost of the helmet is really high for something that is only supposed to last a certain number, you know, a certain amount of time. Um, but that guy took a briefing. He, he was like, I don't want to be the thing that hurts my customers. So the, the, the founder of that company took a briefing. It was pretty cool. Uh, your turn. Um, well, I haven't had my tour yet, but I would love to. I, I've heard that the manufacturing at Tesla is way different than the manufacturing in a traditional car company, because it really is a computer on wheels or a set of them. Um, but actually, you just triggered something slightly adjacent to your previous point. Um, I, I, I like to study Toyota supply chains and the whole Kaizen type stuff a lot. And I, in my studies, I found this amazing chart, which I'm using with the car makers for both software security and secure architecture. It showed the Chevy Volt compared head to head with the Toyota Prius. And the Prius sold, was like 60% the sticker price. Uh, it sold like 40 times as many units in the market in that, in that time period. But when you looked at the number of suppliers, the plant suppliers for Toyota were 1 16th as many suppliers, if I recall. And they made 10 times better use of each supplier. So they had fewer suppliers, higher use of each supplier, which cut down on the cost cut down on the quality issues. Uh, and ultimately, regardless of you know all the other factors that went into its failed market performance with the Chevy Volt, part of it was the battery, it was the wrong battery choice. But that, that too is a supply chain choice. So it, I found that this is a, a really useful vehicle, pardon the pun, to talking to them because they do understand fewer, better suppliers, highest quality supply, supply from high quality suppliers, and elegant designs leads to more profitability and higher customer satisfaction. So making a similar logical security or software security argument is, is very native to them. But yeah, I do think um, some of these modern vehicles um, are designed better or more elegantly than some of the older ones. But it's also the case that the, they might have the same make and model with different uh, suppliers underneath. Um, so they're not even consistent across um, make and year. Oh, okay. So culturally, um, we, I think, I don't think we found a single a car company that didn't have a really passionate, smart cyber person there. Um, I'm really encouraged by that. The, the bottleneck has not been the presence of someone good; it's been executive support, and that's absolutely true. Um, right after, I'm not saying we caused this at all. Don't hear it that way. But right after our five star came out, GM announced their cyber chief, so they made an executive level position. In fact, Craig Smith did a keynote with him at a, a control systems event um, about car hacking, facts and fiction, kind of using the five star. So um, a high profile board level position, uh, someone who reports to the board, um, we thought that was a really good move. It, now it could just be putting lipstick on a pig where they aren't changing anything, but they also happen to have a really good security staff. And one of the things I'm seeing a lot of the car companies do, you know, whether they're announcing them or not, is they're reorging where the security team lives to give them higher status and, and access so it's taken more seriously. It's, it's much like enterprise security. If the CISO reports to a CIO, there's a kind of a conflict of interest, and they'll pretty much just do compliance and nothing more. If they report to general counsel, they might do some better you know, intellectual property protection or data security. So where you report to kind of matters. So part of our coaching to them is also organizationally, like what, which kind of things are hurting you. And sometimes it's bringing in an external voice like us to make their own argument that they already tried to make but because they saw it in The Guardian or in Bloomberg or in you know Forbes magazine, they are able to say, see, look, look, we've been telling you to do this for two years. Can we do it now? So this is why the empathy is so important, because if we assume that they're lazy, irresponsible jerks, we're going to continue to have an adversarial relationship. If you can find somebody who really wants to make it better, they become a, a, a teammate. So part of that collecting, connecting, and collaborating is it was not just connecting researchers to researchers. It was connecting researchers to willing teammates in these affected industries. And I don't think we found a single company that didn't have somebody really good. There is one that still screams at me for their executive person, but there's, there's at least a couple good people pretty much everywhere.
Am I being fair? How's my time? Any more general questions, or can we do some topical stuff? I'm just kidding. A lot. Okay. All right, I'll let you guys pick by votes. Do you want to talk about? I don't even know if I want to offer this. Do, do we want to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly over the G pack and how it played out, or do we want to talk about? Is there more risk than reward for over-the-air updates? I know my opinion on it, but I would like to hear with open ears if people think it's a bad idea to do over-the-air updates. Um, there's other topics like where should they start? Because one of the questions that comes up a lot is should we start with the coordinated disclosure policy? Should we start with the logging so that we can learn more? Should we start with secure design? And I can also talk about the Markey bill because the center Markey bill was kind of baked before we got to them. We did have some influence on making a couple things better. Um, the House Committee is starting later, but they're taking a more methodical approach. So they had lots of briefings on the Five Star before they wrote theirs, so that one could be good. So we could talk about legislation. We could talk about the advice we should be giving them on priority order. We could talk about um, the Charlie do's and don'ts or the good things they did and the things that might have hurt the security community. And I want to hear opinions more than give them. No one has an opinion. You guys all tired? The GPAC? OK, so he's the only vote. Anybody? We can do all of them. I'm just talking about which one's first. OK, so there's, there's a desire to hear about the Markey Bill. Has anyone seen the Markey Bill, by the way? It's called the SPY Act for, what does it stand for? Safety, privacy, what's the lie? Your car, spy car. When I think of that, I think of Spy Hunter with the oil slicks in, this, yeah. in the fog. Yeah. It's such a good game. Okay. Um, I'm looking to you for coaching here. Oh, you know, that's a great one. I'll, I'll throw one more in the mix here. So Bo's point was he would really have to know, um, what do we say to someone who says, how do I make my cart better? Um, can I tweak it a little bit? Because you just triggered one I should have added. Uh, I had several senior executives say, I don't want a bug bounty program. I don't want a coordinated disclosure. We'll pay a pen tester to find stuff. You know, we're willing to pay money. We don't want it. And, and I, I struggled to have a really strong, succinct argument for why a pen tester can only find the thing that the pen tester is good at finding. So that you, know, you can have the fact that a pen tester didn't find anything is not positive proof that there is nothing to find. It's everybody I know, including Chris Nickerson, is, you know, they find things differently. Now, Nickerson is really comprehensive in his approach, so he finds more categories of things than most. But um, one of the, it's actually one of the things I disliked about the Markey bill was it said, um, these cars need to be pen tested. And I said, according to which standard, because there isn't one, and by whom, because there's no certification or standard for a pen tester. So if it's your neighbor's kid, I'm not happy. Because we've seen PCI pen tests that don't even show up. They just do a, a Nessus scan, and they call it a pen test. But we've also seen people that hire Lars and really rigorous ones. So I'm, I'm slightly losing my train of thought. But does anybody have a succinct, would anyone offer a succinct three bullet answer as to why it makes sense to have a coordinated disclosure policy, even if you're willing to pay professionals, besides what I just said? Yeah. All right, so for the audio, the, the basic idea, if I'm going to summarize, but tell me if I got it right. The ability to handle it in a coordinated way versus responding to it on the news? OK. Yeah, I gave a couple other answers, but be, before I lead the witnesses, I want to hear other people's ideas. Anybody else? You only pay for success. OK. Scales better. Nature, look, I, I, have, I have a biology background. Nature loves diversity, right? You know, cast as wide a net as possible, right? right yeah. And there's no wrong answers, by the way. We're brainstorming.
Yep, and there's a lot covered on the economics of people that, depending on your morality, you might weaponize it, sell it first, and then go to the bug bounty program. A lot of these don't pay very much money, so it's really not about the money. Um, and let me point this out. I actually don't suggest a bug bounty first. I suggest a coordinated disclosure first. Like, we won't sue you. Then you can, if you want to go straight for a bug bounty, go for it. But a lot of them don't have the bandwidth to receive a flood at once. So it's more palatable to start with, let's do a recognition and reward program, a recognition program, or, um, and I'm not talking about our automakers, I'm talking about anyone. Like, I've helped a lot of folks. Katie Mazur, now she's at HackerOne, she's coached a lot of folks on the ending, started with a coordinated disclosure policy. And the minimum viable product is have a submission place and say you won't sue them. And that pretty much is golden to insulate researchers from risk. Uh, but but yeah, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. That's what I want to talk to you guys about because we clearly haven't gotten very many companies to declare a uh, coordinated disclosure policy. So I'm not saying my arguments are very successful. Yeah. Uh, you next. Uh, Better Business Bureau. So we flirted with trying to do that. We just we we've been trying to not take sides. Me an honest broker. One of the things that that five star should indicate to you is it's multi stakeholder by design. The people who want to buy a safe car can use it to, to, to choose a safer car. The regulators can cut and paste it as the blueprint for their regulation. The insurers can use it to price, price risk premiums because a two-door sports car costs more insurance than a four-door family sedan. So they, these things can be useful for the insurers. It's useful to the trial lawyers. Your car company only had two of the five stars. Everyone else had four of the five stars. So therefore, you weren't doing as good as everyone else. And it's useful to the automakers in the OEM on the, in the supply chain to know the kind of things that um, would be beneficial as a foundation. So we kept it multi-stakeholder deliberately. And I think that's, I don't think we understood how important that was until we got halfway through it, but man, was that a good move. <laughs> Multiple third parties doing what? The evaluate? Yeah, so we're not doing, I guess the, what I didn't tie it back to get to your original question is, we're not doing the evaluations, but people are encouraging us to, but there's nothing stopping Consumer Reports, or Kelly's Blue Book, or Auto Trader, from deciding to score these based on publicly available information. So whether or not they've told us they have a court, uh, an over-the-air update system, we know BMW does because we saw it in their analysis. They never called and said, hey, we have one, we want to start. Uh, so one of the mistakes we made is when we said five star, we thought that would be familiar, but then people assumed it would be a rating system. And it certainly could be, but to, to remain an honest broker and trusted by all the different stakeholders, uh, we don't want to start becoming at odds with the automakers we're trying to help. But yeah, there's, there's, it's a free market. People could take that five star and use it to score people. And in fact, Craig thinks if people don't get their act together by the end of the year, that I should do it. <laughs> Maybe we will. All right. Um, No, I don't think this is an addition to the assessment. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, all of these are trailing indicators. You've already failed to do, you know, potentially you've already failed to do threat modeling, secure design, hardening. So in the Microsoft SEL, the final leg is the post-deploy, you know, security assessment, which isn't really assuring security, it's measuring it, right? You, and you can't prove a negative. But now, you, this is probably, the font's probably too small here, but the three, each one of the stars has some defining success factors. One of them is standards-based, so we, we were suggesting that people just use the ISO coordinated disclosure standards that uh, Katie Mazuris and others worked on. Uh, the one that's about taking and, and feeding back is uh, ISO 30111, and the minimum uh, criteria is essentially, do you have a submission, and will you acknowledge receipt that you got the bug reported within seven days of the report? It doesn't have anything about like how quickly you have to fix it or anything, but it creates a paper trail to say, yes, we got the bug report. Um, and we're going to ignore it. Or yes, we got it, and we'll fix it within 90 days or, or nine months or whatever it is. But the second thing we did is we said it, we encouraged positive incentives like risk, like uh, recognition and reward things. This could be t-shirts or challenge coins. It could be um, miles, like United Airlines did miles. Some people groaned at it. Some guy got a million miles because he just took it to heart, and that's going to turn into vacation for his family, right? Um, 
And then the third thing, though, is we really like encouraging the known interfaces. Because if you lo look at something like a bug crowd or hacker one, it really dampens the variance for both parties, right? Regardless of which automaker it is, a researcher will get a consistent interface into various levels of, of automakers behind that interface. And vice versa, you know, we're as dynamic and diverse and hyperbolic and volatile in our variety as um, they are, maybe more so. So an automaker gets a consistent experience at the dampening from a, one of these coordination services. So we're not endorsing one over the other. Or the, in fact, they're quite different in their approach. And there could be other market solutions. But we really encourage, don't become an expert at coordination. Let someone else do that. No one does their own payroll anymore. They pay ADP. No one does their own CRM anymore. They use salesforce.com or something like that. So we think this is a great place that you can get this started quicker if you just leverage a proven model from somebody else. In fact, I got implicit support from Casey to consider maybe making it even easier for automakers or medical device people, basically anyone affected by public safety and human life issues, to make the, the adoption even easier. And I'm, and I'm trying to do a similar conversation with HackerOne. Is this good for that topic? One of the ones you guys left out that I said is, and I'm not sure this is good, but maybe this will stimulate one more idea. I said, look, um, it builds confidence in your customers. It's saying, look how much we care about your safety that we're willing to take bugs from anywhere. Right? We, we, your safety is so important to us that even though we do all these things to ourselves, we want every possibility to find and, re and remediate these things quicker. So it's, it's mo mostly a PR stunt. right? I mean, Honda had a commercial saying backup cameras are standard in all our vehicles now as a feature that they were saying how awesome they were to care about you. But the, the part they left out is, is now law to have to have a backup camera in all vehicles by a certain date. So they turned a requirement into a positive marketing spin. Good for them. And, and so I, I argued that having a coordinated disclosure policy sows goodwill and, and, and establishes and or maintains confidence in your customer. That was actually probably the more effective argument because it was talking to an executive, not a technician. All right. All right, Bo's in charge. What's next, Bo? I get tired of my own voice, so I almost want to. All right, so who, if you were, if you could wave a magic wand, because no one's going to be able to do all five of the five stars at once, which ones would you tell them to start with, or which one, two, would you tell them to start with, and why? What's the easiest path to enlightenment to get started? If you think of it as a crawl, walk, run, where would you start? You first. Really focus on the out. Secure by design? Um, yeah. yeah. And secure by design, obviously, there's nothing that's secure, but our point is, you know, Developing and honing and, and, and implementing a secure development life cycle. That's the whole point. Because, I mean, that's the end game, right? Like, we start building okay. security into these things. We log what's happening today, remotely exploitable, self contained bugs. Okay. Go to work. That's the end game. So, his argument is this is the more strategic fix. Um, some might, and just to play devil's advocate, that might not have any payout for a couple of years. So, so, the downside of that one is it may not stop the bleeding right now. Whereas something like coordinated disclosure could start immediately, maybe. Um, OK, so that's an argument. Anybody else? Yes, Klaus. Some of the Oh, by the way, an OEM is an original equipment manufacturer, and it means someone like an Audi, a Toyota. When we say OEM, we mean those guys. So Klaus is arguing that a lot of them are already considering segmentation and isolation, so helping to improve their aim might be good. As an example of bad aim, when the Boeing 787 Dreamliner said they were going to collapse the cabling uh, for the avionics network and the infotainment network, because it cuts down on the weight, which cuts down on fuel consumption, which saves billions in fuel, jet fuel costs and helps the environment, that kind of argument was a really strong argument. I said, um, how are you? Segmenting and isolating when there's no logical, when there's only logical separation, and the original answers were terrifyingly bad. So they had been led to believe that some really, really, really weak VLAN-esque moves were going to keep them isolated. So the the fix there wasn't to rearchitect the the avionics and the weight ratios of the plane. It was to improve their hypothesis or their their aim to make, pick better logical and physical isolation. Some of the advice was taken, some of it was not. 
whether or, or not planes can fly sideways. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? what I'm going I'm to make a, a commentary for a second. There was so, and this is partly our fault. There was so much analysis and debate and conjecture and mocking of whether or not Side Dragon did or didn't do X, Y, or Z. It completely distracted the media attention from the fact that the planes share connected circuitry in a very dangerous way. Because the question should have been something along the lines of, what can any passenger do to affect the, air fl the flight of the aircraft from the passenger cabin? Any journalist could have and should have asked that. And for weeks, no one did. And the only answer I'll accept to that question is not a goddamn thing. But that's not the case. There are things that you can affect. So all of our debate and echo chamber bashing on what he did or didn't do or where he did or didn't do it and whether he was making stuff up or not completely eclipsed the conversation about how um, vulnerable are those architectures and designs. So similarly, you know, we have to be really careful about how we react to future you know, life and death stunt hacks or not stunt hacks or the revelation of some of these weaknesses so that we have a balanced look at what's the burden of the best actions of the research community and what's the implications for the affected industry or else we're going to, you know, waste a perfectly good opportunity to have a substantive discussion. So hopefully I wasn't too preachy there, but I think we have to be really measured in our response and not be so reactive and hyperbolic. And if you heard Nickerson on the panel here, you know, we have a lot of people who will point fingers and make fun of others, but we don't have a lot of people offering you know, concrete solutions. And you want to see more doing. You inspired that sidebar, sorry. Apollo. Stress and burnout, is it now? No one told me. That's what they were calling me about. All right. Bo, can you continue? 